Well, first, I'd like to thank uh, Jeff for inviting me to come here and, and speak with you all today. Um, I feel very honored to have uh, as many customers and, uh, that, as I have that are appreciative of what I do and support uh, me doing what I love. And that's basically tinkering with instruments uh, and, re and restoring them to the, the kind of instrument that they were before somebody ran over them or something like that. Um, I'm, I'm not a researcher. I'm not a, a teacher. Uh, I don't get in front of people and speak very often, so I'm going to apologize in advance for my awkwardness. Uh, it's also my first PowerPoint presentation, and um, <clears throat> I did it all myself with the exception of a little help from Jason Casanova, my friend uh, from uh, the, Atlanta, the Georgia Brass Band. And um, <clears throat> I was working literally up till midnight last night to put, put this together. And I would also want to thank Tim Godby here, our expert in the electronics end of this. He seamlessly uh, helped us get over the few flaws I had in the presentation. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, one of the biggest questions I get uh, every day, practically, is what's the difference between a trumpet and a cornet? And um, <clears throat> it turns out that it's, it's a complicated question, actually. And it, and it really depends on w what period of instruments you're asking about, because there has been an evolution of both families of brass instruments. And so we're going to take a look at that, is how this, they started to evolve during the 19th century, which is when things like valves and th uh, stuff uh, came into being, and they became more of a musical uh, type of uh, <clears throat> instrument rather than just a signal instrument. So we'll, the old adage is that the difference between a trumpet and a cornet is that a uh, trumpet is two-thirds cylindrical in its bore and one-third conical. And by contrast, the cornet is supposed to be two-thirds conical and one-third cylindrical. And there's some accurate information in that and some that is really sort of dubious. So let's look a little bit at first a basic trumpet like uh, existed for hundreds and hundreds of years through the Renaissance up into the classical and romantic periods. And <clears throat> generally speaking, the description that I uh, gave before is fairly accurate. It consists of two yards or straight runs of cylindrical tubing that are connected to each other with uh, cylindrical bows and then into a length of tubing equally long that flares into the bell. And that's the conical section, obviously. Uh, the lead pipe has no uh, conicity to it whatsoever. You get a little bit of um, <clears throat> conicity coming out of the backbore of the mouthpiece, but that's really it. And the mouthpieces were a little bit longer in those days, so you did have a little bit of a taper, but that was generally uh, the rule, two-thirds cylindrical. Uh, and the shape of the trumpet was pretty standard for hundreds of years. There were some fancy examples of coiled horns. You'll, you know, the guy who played box Brandenburg uh, Weidinger had a, uh, is shown with a coiled horn uh, trumpet, but um, but generally speaking, they've almost always been in this shape. Uh, slight difference between the German style and the uh, English style of trumpet is that the the Germans like to put a wooden block between the two the bell stay and the uh, first yard to uh, to create a handhold and to uh, st sturdy, uh, make it of sturdier construction, whereas the uh, other instrument above it is uh, got no block uh, laced with uh, felt. It, uh, it's an English-style trumpet, and it was a little bit uh, more awkward to hold. And if you'll notice on the, uh, the lower instrument, you've got a, an example of a crook. Uh, and we'll talk a, lot, a little bit about that in the next, uh, a little alert later down the road. Now, the cornet, on the other hand, is uh, from the horn family. It uh, could be considered the soprano horn, uh, sometimes known as a post horn in uh, historical times. Uh, and generally, it comes you know, from the family of, of instruments that were developed out of natural uh, occurring animal horns. So they are conical in their bore, continuously conical. 
naturally, but uh, it was later on when we added valves that there was added some cylindrical uh, tubing to it. But generally speaking, they're considered co continuously conical. <clears throat> and the difference harmonically or acoustically between cylindrical instruments and conical is that the natural harmonic series is slightly different between them. And so you get a different uh, <clears throat> profile of overtones, which ones are dominant and which are not. We call horns generally a darker sound, <clears throat> more mellow, and uh, conical instru or uh, cylindrical instruments are generally described as brighter and brassier. So, uh, next. Um, some of the differences also between the two is that they really didn't have um, very much overlap in terms of the voice that they played in the, uh, uh, the family of brasses. The trumpets were pitched generally uh, from C up to G, but in the um, period of the Baroque, Renaissance, and Classical, they were built uh, twice the length of our modern instruments. Uh, why? Because uh, it became common to play them in the upper tessitura so that they could play, be played diatonically. And uh, so that longer length allowed them to be played uh, it, where we like to hear them best. Um, so for instance, uh, the C trumpet of the, uh, the Baroque era was roughly an eight foot long instrument. Today it's, it's roughly four feet long, um, <clears throat> and so on and so forth. Uh, in trumpet playing, the, the style of playing, where you played on the horn, where you were at home playing, is like we are today. You know, we've got high note players and we've got uh, middle register and low register players. Uh, and the, the low register players were called principale, players, and they played the things that were, co were commonly used for military calls or signal functioning. They were uh, used uh, to, you know, sometimes play at dinner parties and feasts uh, to announce, of course, the arrival of, of dignitaries to signal uh, in wartime. Um, they were used in the military a lot. Uh, there were tower uh, watchmen who or, or, or like an alarm clock, they, they signaled various functions during the day and things like that. Uh, very much like bugle, bugle calls do uh, in the military today. And then there was the <clears throat> clarino playing, which was done up in the upper register, and they could play diatonically. And those were the players who during the Baroque played Handel and Bach uh, uh, type of music, uh, and were sort of uh, uh, a rare breed. They, they were the ones that learned how to uh, get enough compression and enough air behind it and control the instrument. Uh, now the signal players obviously had to be heard over long distances. They required a large volume of sound. But when you're playing up in those upper register in those long instruments, you had to have a lot of control. And it was really sort of sotto voce, very soft and delicate playing. It wasn't uh, like our screech, screaming type of players that we have today. A, a very delicate sound, <clears throat> very treacherous and very out of tune, required a lot of lip control to pull pitches into uh, proper tune. Yes. So this is um, a typical F trumpet, which became uh, sort of the most common uh, orchestral type of trumpet. It's this time double folded so that the arms are half the length they were before. And it would also be supplied with crooks so that if you were playing in a complex uh, piece that modulated into different keys, you would have to have time to uh, pull your mouthpiece out, put in a length of tubing to lower the pitch, and then put your mouthpiece back in and play in a different key. Um, today, of course, we, we do this all mentally transposing because we have a chromatic instrument. but. Uh, in those days, it was, it was a juggling act, literally. Um, as uh, players wanted to improve the uh, moving around diat diatonically on the horn, uh, 
Uh, they came up with various types of mechanisms to aid in that, to mostly to aid intonation, but to also to get a few extra notes off of the horn. And one of them was a slide trumpet. <clears throat> uh, but the slide on these moves to the opposite direction of a trombone. And uh, it didn't have very much throw, so you could only, really only get a whole tone and a half tone out of the, uh, the movement. But they, they came up with spring mechanisms so that it would re return to its original position and things like that. And uh, were, were quite effective in helping to improve the intonation uh, and to uh, <clears throat> add a few of the notes that don't exist in the uh, harmonic series uh, as, we, as, as a natural uh, part of the, the horns. So this is going to be Barry Boggess performing on that very slide trumpet that was pictured on the screen. <laughs> One thing I'd like to do before I go on is to uh, thank uh, the Utley Collection and Sabina Klaus, its curator, for let, letting me have some of these nice photographs. Uh, these are instruments, uh, some of which that I helped restore uh, many years ago uh, for Joe Utley. And um, it, uh, he's bequeathed his collection to the National Music Museum and, and hired Sabina Klaus to be the curator. And she was gracious enough to let me come and and choose some of the photographs that she's put together for a uh, beautiful uh, documentation of the entire collection. And it'll be out in a few years. and It'll be worth having. Okay. Another uh, intonation and uh, note-adding device was the use of clapper-style keys as were being used on woodwind instruments like clarinets and flutes. Um, obviously, if you can lengthen the, uh, the air column by pulling the, the uh, slide tube, uh, you can shorten the air column by cutting a hole in the instrument. And if you keep your finger over the hole or keep a clapper key over the hole, it'll be the normal sounding length. And then you open it, the, the sound will come out through that hole. You just have to, of course, know where to place those holes. But eventually, they did figure out uh, where to uh, add these holes. and. After experiments with two and three uh, keys, they, they eventually expanded up to 11 keys. So you actually could play uh, quite complicated pieces. And um, as the popularity of this grew and techniques developed, the um, use of key trumpets, but especially key bugles, and members of the bugle family uh, that became in the bass uh, voice became known as the Alpha Clydes. These uh, entire bands of these uh, instruments were uh, spreading all over the military, especially in England, uh, which the Royal Kent Bugle was very, very popular. And uh, in the United States as well, uh, keyed, in keyed instruments uh, spread like wildfire. And um, lots of um, competition between bands to prove who was the most virtuosic player on these things. The only problem with them is that the more of those keys you have open, the, the less centered the sound is. And it just gets a little woofy and um, <clears throat> stuffy sounding. Uh, however, in the hands of a good performer, you could really have quite a, a musical performance. <clears throat> and then around uh, eight, 1815 or so, we had the introduction of the first valves. A fellow named Stolzl, uh, working with a partner, um, developed, at, f at first, it was an actual square box, a little um, rectangular device that moved up and, and down inside of a chamber with you know ports drilled through it. But it wasn't very successful. So he uh, came up with another uh, uh, valve that um, actually became part of the air path. The, um, 
the, the, this, the air goes into the valve and then down through the bottom, out through a tube, and up into the next valve. You can see the little loop between the first and second valve of the uh, three valve instrument. Now, because they were in their experimental stage, they, they applied at first just one valve, then two valves. And j normally, the, the first valve was a half tone, second valve was the whole tone. Um, and these types of instruments proliferated for you know 25 years or so before they got the bright idea that adding a third one would give a full chromatic uh, t uh, capability to the horns. And uh, when they added the third valve, they discovered that it was better to move the second valve uh, to be the halftone uh, valve and the first valve just for the coordination of it. It seemed to work out better. Uh, but there are many examples in the early 1800s of two-valved or uh, three-valve instruments where the first valve is a half tone and the second valve is the whole tone. And they still kept with the tradition of adding crooks to change the key of the instruments. Um, uh, and because of, you know, the security, you were... You were learning all these new fingerings, and if you had to play in keys with lots of sharps or something like that, uh, rather than be worried about your finger technique, it was much easier to throw in a tubing uh, to make it in the uh, pitched the instrument pitched in the key where you didn't have any sharps and flats, and you would have to adjust the length of the slides in order for it to play in tune with itself. But it took away all the worry of playing in difficult keys. <clears throat> um, now, the thing is that trumpet players have 300 years or more of technique history and uh, music that they've been playing. Um, they don't necessarily like these new valves and stuff that are making uh, the instruments, uh, well, they have to relearn a whole thing, you know, and they've been playing masterfully for years and they don't want to take on this task. So the trumpet guilds, uh, and the horn guilds um, basically reject the introduction of these uh, devices for a long time. Um, and in fact, um, I would say it was a good 50 years before they started to welcome the idea of it. And it was mainly because they were forced by composers who wanted these new tonalities to be added to uh, their compositions uh, they started forcing them to uh, switch to these new instruments. But uh, it turns out that the cornet is essentially a new fangled instrument that nobody had seen before. The adaption of valves onto the post horn, um, you know, was, you know, there was like, you know, post horns were only used by mail carriers. They were, they were to announce the uh, arrival of the postman uh, to your gate or to your town. And uh, if you think about the Mozart post horn uh, solo, it's based in octaves. Da -da -dee, da -da -dee. Well, that was because that was the traditional call of the post, post carrier. Um, and of course, he doesn't play anything else but those particular notes, you know, and a fifth uh, higher. So in that particular symphony. But then when you add valves to it, he, that sound is capable of being uh, played uh, diatonically or chromatically, and uh, it, the composers started getting excited about this. And um, <clears throat> so, uh, again, uh, trumpet guilds, because of the nature of unions and guilds, uh, resisted this change, but uh, because of the I mean, basically, military bands uh, formed uh, around the uh, composition of these new instruments that could uh, readily be bought and learned quickly. Uh, they, uh, they started uh, introducing them to military bands, and Adolf Sachs got in on this movement, developed the concept of a matched choir of brass instruments with three valves, um, he, they were called saxhorns in those days, um, and this family uh, started in the soprano with E flat, what we now call cornets, but would have been a saxhorn. Uh, 
at, down to, through the alto, tenor, uh, baritone, and bass family uh, to what we now call the modern tuba. But basically, uh, it was, they were all the same technique. You, if you learned the technique on one of them, you could play all the whole family, just get a, adapted to the difference in the size of the mouthpiece. Um, so uh, he sold the idea basically to the French military and um, it made his career. Trouble is that everybody else thought that they had come up with the same idea. So he was in lawsuits for the rest of his life based on patent infringements and things like that. Uh, and the French really contested each other bitterly over it. And um, he won and lost fortunes over and over again. Um, and, uh, but we owe, as brass players, we owe very much to Adolf Sachs, uh, who it seems ironic because uh, the saxophone really sort of is foremost in people's minds when they think of Adolf Sachs, but he really started the, the brass band movement and gave it some real uh, impetus in the uh, about 1850-ish or so. Next. Uh, I'm showing you all these different valves because, of course, as a, a tinkerer, I'm interested in all these mechanical ways of, uh, of playing the horns and, and changing notes. And uh, one of the very popular and still exists today is what was called Vienna valves or twin tube or double piston valves. And <clears throat> basically, there's a little diagram there about how the air goes through those. These uh, two tubes running parallel to each other actually have to be um, raised so that the uh, air, air path co goes into the uh, extra length of tubing. Uh, there were all kinds of different spring mechanisms to, to return it to its uh, thing, and this is sort of a clapper key type of uh, adaptation. But there's uh, three different adaptations of the, the Vienna valve uh, on different types of horns. But you see that the one is positioned, or two of them look like they're positioned upside down, and that's because the uh, the movement is opposite of what would seem like the intuitive way that they actually move. But uh, still to this day, the uh, Vienna, Vienna Philharmonic horn section and trumpet section use this type of uh, valve on their horns. Okay. And then about 1828, uh, a German by the name of Blumel came up with the first successful rotary valves. Again, another instrument or a valve that is uh, still being used today. Uh, many creative ways that they experimented with uh, putting them on horns. And these, here's a few examples. Uh, notice the cornet in the lower left-hand corner retains that circular post horn shape. Uh, again, a traditional shape that they wanted to uh, retain. But little by little, we started getting the modern shepherd's crook style, uh, just because it was a little bit easier to adapt the valves into position that way. And uh, then the instrument on the right is an over-the-shoulder instrument, which were popular from the middle of the century up through the Civil War. And this one is a hybrid instrument in that it is a rotary valve instrument with clapper keys. And we don't know exactly how whoever had this built uh, performed on it. We don't know if he used them both at the same time, but we don't think so. Uh, it was sort of either or, but we think that maybe he uh, used it with some of the upper register notes just to clean up intonation or to uh, help them uh, sound a little bit more easily. Because you're obviously shortening, shortening the horn uh, and it's like uh, people ask me to put little uh, mini bells on their piccolo trumpets uh, for playing the, the Brandenburg on the fourth valve. If you have a little bell in that section, you're, you're going through less tubing, so it's a little bit easier to get those high notes out. All right, uh, next. The, uh, around 1835, uh, a very popular valve was invented called the Berliner Pumpen Valve, and it's a Simple, simple valve that uh, rapidly got into production and uh, spread uh, all over the continent and, and to the United States. Um, 
and they were quite successful, except for that they're they're quite uh, wide in comparison to a modern trumpet valve, and so there's a lot of surface area. So they tend to get rather uh, slow as they dry out if you don't have proper oil. Uh, there's just so much surface friction, but um, they did. Uh, they were so easy to produce that a lot of makers got into the production of brass instruments through these this type of valve and. Um, in, so many instruments proliferated and uh, spread the popularity of the brass band. <clears throat> the, uh, this is an odd one that I uh, decided to add just because I love these curiosities. This was the Shaw patented lever disc valve. And it, um, it actually is a, a valve that uh, there's a little disc that's contained inside of a chamber and on the back side of that disc is the actual valve loop that the, uh, the slide length that is going to be turned and as the it actually rotates the entire uh, uh, instead of just redirecting air it's actually redirecting the tubing uh, in a 180 degree pattern. Uh, very uh, successful in a day, but very delicate, and they were not easy to maintain, so they went out of favor f fairly quickly. But a hundred years later, Ernst Albert Couturier started using those as a quick change from B flat to A uh, on his cornets. And so it was interesting that, you know, what I knew from, you know, picture books and from at least collection, I find, son suddenly saw one on a 20th century instrument. I thought, well, this is really odd. Uh, so there's nothing new, you know. Every, <laughs> so, all right. Next, uh, 1839. The what we consider a modern valve was invented by a fellow named Perrinet, and uh, uh, essentially it is uh, remained unchanged with minor uh, adjustments to how the air ports through the valves. But basically, uh, rather than using the valve, the piston as an part of the air path, it just slices through the air path and changes the direction of the air. And uh, these have been used since 1839, and by <clears throat> 20 years or so, they had perfected them and pretty much standardized them. Some manufacturers chose uh, a path straight through uh, the, the uh, uh, axis of the valves, and others used a slightly curved pattern through. But generally speaking, uh, they've, this style of valve is what we use today. Uh, again, lots of trumpet players shied away from this, uh, but eventually they, uh, they couldn't resist the tide of progress. Uh, what we have up here, again, is a circular style cornet with uh, Perronet valves and then a modern style shepherd's crook cornet. The odd instrument on the left was a six-valved instrument, which was an attempt to give you perfect intonation uh, with each valve that you depress. You know, as you press uh, each valve down, the, the, well, by the time you get to the three-valve combination, you're, you're getting way out of tune, and you have to either lip or adjust your slides. So the six-valve instrument was an attempt to get a chromatic scale that was perfectly in tune with itself. Uh, but just think if you had to learn how to play that thing, right? You know, it's very different. But it... Uh, like a clarinet, it's the, the lower keys uh, are the lower notes, and it progresses up from there. Um, it's also very heavy and unwieldy. So they didn't uh, spread very quickly, but they were probably novelties that, uh, you know, performers would drag out for one piece on a concert or something. And then the, the last photograph in the bottom right-hand corner is a typical uh, F trumpet for orchestra work uh, towards the end of the 18th century, probably 1880s to 1890s. Um, again, we're still using trumpets of double the length of modern uh, orchestral trumpets. Uh, and they still played them up in the upper tessitura to get uh, the high notes that we're, we're used to in romantic literature. <clears throat> All right, we're going to look at, again, the difference between trumpets and cornets. Uh, the mouthpiece on a trumpet uh, 
is, uh, well, the one on the left in the diagram is, would be a Baroque or classical type of trumpet. Notice that the rim is quite flat and the bowl quite pronounced in a cup shape. And then entrance into the throat or the back bore is quite sharp. There's no real transition. Uh, and this is very characteristic of, of mouthpieces uh, starting from the medieval period all the way up through uh, the classical period. And then on the right is a modern trumpet mouthpiece, uh, which, as you can see, has a, a more uh, soft bite on the inner edge of the uh, mouthpiece rim and uh, less of a bowl shape, although some, some trumpet uh, makers or manufacturers of mouthpieces uh, do offer bowl shapes, but then you have a gradual uh, transition into the throat, which speeds up the air. But, the, but when you're playing in that upper tessitura, this Baroque mouthpiece actually helps you to attain better articulation and centering of notes and uh, ease of uh, some flexibility in altering the pitch a little bit by lipping. This uh, picture here was the mouthpiece that was on that slide trumpet that you heard Barry Boggess play. It was an exception in that it's a very deep, almost flugelhorn-like mouthpiece. And, and I wonder about the, the British uh, approach to brass playing. The, uh, cornets and trumpets and flugelhorns often have deep funnel-shaped mouthpieces like that. Uh, and it seems to be part of their tradition. Okay. By comparison, the cornet uh, mouthpiece is, uh, especially because they're part of the horn family, are deep V-shaped uh, cups with a narrower, slightly rounded rim that gives you flexibility. And um, they tend to uh, flav uh, favor the uh, delicate articulation and uh, wide slots so that you can uh, Again, adjust pitch of out of tune notes, uh, and um, you have um, mm, what, what I should, should say. One, for me, the 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 difference that I, when I'm approaching trumpet for, for cornet, and I ex advise people this when they come into a brass band, if you're switching from trumpet to cornet, think of a feminine version of the trumpet. Trumpet's more masculine and hard edged, whereas the cornet you should think of as softer, rounder, um, not shrill and hysterical. <laughs> uh, anyway. Okay, so we come to the modern era. Um, around 1860, the Besson Company came up with an improvement of the Perronet valve system, uh, which sort of standardized the path of the air through the valves, like if you don't mind if I pick this up, you'll notice that the air is uh, passage is a little bit higher in this side than on this side. This is this was the in, the improvement that they advertised in their catalog was this stepped path through the valve casing, and essentially, since 1860, valve casings haven't changed. Some some guys get inventive and experiment with different things, but the modern trumpet and cornet essentially came up, uh, was established in 1860 by, by uh, Besson. And since then, it's just been minor refinements. Um, however, the, again, the trumpet community wasn't interested. It wasn't until 20 years later that uh, they were applied to trumpets. <clears throat> and um, by this time, the cornet has established itself as the star of the brass world uh, in public performance. So uh, basically the guys who are learning how to play these things like Arben and Levy and uh, Arbuckle, they're, they're rock stars. I mean, they're, they're performing all over to sold out houses all over the world. They have uh, signature uh, or, or memorabilia being sold. Uh, you can find to this day mugs with the distant family uh, quartet on them and things like that. Um, they're really quite well known. If you look on eBay, you can find that sort of stuff uh, all the time. They're having, you know, commissioning pieces to show off the capabilities of their instruments, and uh, so cornet playing is is uh, 
you know, crazy. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun to be a cornet player in those days. They often become the leaders of brass bands. And uh, in those days, brass bands, they allowed a few little woodwind instruments now and then for color. Uh, but, but generally speaking, the brass band existed in various uh, voicings and combinations of instruments, um, pretty much as we see it today. Uh, the, the Brits, who liked tradition so much, uh, standardized a 28-voice choir that uh, is still in use uh, today and is, is finding a resurgence of inter interest in the United States. We had a very similar brass band movement here until about the 1920s, and we'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes. But you, you see there's a page of a catalog here. This would have been a uh, boozy catalog from 1883. And you see the top three instruments are E-flat cornets. So they offered three versions of E-flat cornets. And then you see two trumpets, both, uh, I think, in F. And that's the only uh, type of trumpet they built in those days. And then they had a page with a dozen and a half uh, different types of B-flat, C, and A cornets. So cornets were being built like crazy, but there wasn't that much interest in valved uh, trumpets, even up in the 1880s. Uh, and it isn't until the 1920s that there's a widespread demand for three valve trumpets like we have today. And we'll, we'll be talking about that. Look at this little odd bugle in the far right hand corner. You see the natural bugle on the left. And the other one is got a removable valve section so that you could play it chromatically. You could just plug it into the to the mouthpiece receiver so you could uh, play tunes on the, on the bugle. That's essentially a flugelhorn uh, that we know it today uh, with the valves removable. Okay. So <clears throat> just to give you an idea of what kind of music was being played in those days by cornet soloists, here's a, an example. Obviously, that was just a popular song, The Last Days of Summer. And if you think of 
concerts and recitals back then. They were usually uh, parlor or house concerts, um, not big performance halls like this, usually um, small intimate gatherings. Um, and I understand that, for instance, Jules Levy, who was wildly popular, um, traveled all over the world. He pretty much played the same three pieces through his entire career, almost refused to do anything else but those three pieces. Uh, of course, I'm sure that they were crazy, wild, virtuosic things that it took a, a good deal of work to, to keep up with. But still, um, people wanted to hear that. If, you know, from town to town, you didn't have records that just, you know, uh, spread, you know, so that everybody could hear it. So his reputation preceded him. They wanted to hear this song, and that's what he gave them. So uh, it's not uncommon. Uh, all right, now moving a little bit into the 20th century, we uh, come to Vincent Bach. And I'm going to discuss him a little bit because <clears throat> at this point, we've seen how there's a difference between the cornet and the trumpet in the, the, the overall shape. But um, as we started to add these valves, the cornets had to take on a little bit of uh, cylindrical section to them. Uh, and it turns out that that was beneficial in terms of the response of the instrument, the intonation. So uh, integrating some portion of it uh, as being uh, cylindrical as opposed to continuously conical was a benefit to the uh, playability of the instrument. Uh, now, Vincent Bach had a, uh, somewhat of a career as a cornet soloist, uh, and when he came over to the United States, he uh, had to supplement that by playing in orchestras, so he had to start playing trumpets as well, and he wasn't too satisfied with uh, what was available, so he, being a bit of an engineer, uh, started uh, tinkering with them, and he came up with the idea that <clears throat> Really, the cornet and trumpet bell should be essentially the same. And instead of a cylindrical lead pipe on a trumpet, uh, it should be a tapered lead pipe. That was a new idea. Not, not exactly new with Bach, because when they came up with this standardized uh, valve casing uh, and layout of the air path, they realized that they could put in a short taper. But uh, basically, Bach said to himself, I like the way the cornet plays. Uh, and sounds, but they're not going to let me play it in the orchestra. <laughs> so maybe I can make my trumpet uh, more, more like my, my cornet. And uh, so it's easier to play, and, uh, but still has some of the trumpet sound. And sure enough, by sort of unwrapping the cornet and stretching it out into a trumpet shape, he found that it was quite playable and had all, this, all the characteristics of uh, trumpet. Um, with the projection and the bright uh, harmonics, provided you change the mouthpiece. So there's a difference that that deep funnel-shaped cornet mouthpiece gives the characteristic mellow, uh, dark qualities of cornet, and the trumpet mouthpiece uh, gives it, gave it, it the sound of the trumpet. Now, you switch it up, if you play a cornet with a trumpet-style mouthpiece, it's going to sound like a trumpet. If you were to do an A-B test with blindfold yourself and, and listen to the two instruments uh, played with the same type of mouthpiece, you're not going to be able to hear the difference. The performer can feel the difference because the sound is closer to them with the short cornet and the response is a little different because of the extra bends. But essentially, the audience, unless it's an audience of you know, very particular trumpet players, uh, it, the audience isn't going to know the difference. But perception is something. So he, he built trumpets that were basically stretched out cornets. <clears throat> and you'll see, you know, you'll see today, even the models have the same markings on the bell. The number 43 bell is available on a cornet or a trumpet, uh, 37 it's, and 72, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the lead pipe is the same. The only difference is that he uses a longer portion of the taper for the cornet uh, and a shorter one for the trumpet just cuts it off at a bigger starting point and, and uses slightly less of the taper. So uh, we have some examples of Vincent Bach playing uh, on the cornet. And this was recorded before he started building instruments, so it's probably a Holton new proportion cornet. <clears throat> 
that was actually a recording done uh, on an Edison disc. He was uh, one of the early uh, collaborators with Edison uh, who was looking all, all around for talent and people that he could rec record on his new invention. And, and somehow Bach convinced him to, uh, to give him a chance, and he, and he did it. So uh, not too many of those exist. They weren't widely distributed. Uh, but there's a um, trumpet uh, website, I think Bachology or something like that, where you can hear that. And then the next one was recorded later to introduce his new cornet in 1927. Okay, um, I want to talk about uh, some of the experimentations that were going on uh, that led Bach to uh, uh, come up with his idea um, and what other manufacturers were doing. I mean, I'm going to call these hybrids and crossbreeds. Um, the top left-hand corner is, uh, an, if you'll notice the valve slides, they're not parallel to each other. They're sort of teardrop shaped. This was an instrument by a fellow named Ernst Albert Couturier, who was called the Wizard of the Cornet uh, at the turn of the century. He was a cornet virtuoso who uh, came up with the idea that horn, uh, brass instruments should be continuously conical. So he patented the idea and uh, went to uh, Holton to uh, see if they would build him this horn. And they said, well, no, I don't think we agree with you on that, but uh, we'll, we'll design a horn that we think would work for you. And uh, he endorsed that horn for a while. But he was obsessed with this idea, so he went to York, J.W. York and Sons, and uh, they built him a prototype of the design that he had patented, which was continuously conical through all the valve loops. Uh, very difficult to engineer, because every port on, on the valve is a the different size. Um, and so it gets, you know, co very complex. Uh, so this is why they're teardropped, is because they're conical through those loops. Uh, so you're not going to, they don't have to be parallel because you're not going to be pulling the slides out. Uh, so they're fixed, and that's one of the problems with the horn, of course, is if you get repair, have to do repairs, they're difficult to, to work on. However, they are a very responsive instrument with a beautiful sound um, and very lovely. Uh, the cornets in particular are uh, a delight to play. The trouble is with all this conicity is it changes the harmonic placement too. So they're, they're not as easy to play in tune, uh, especially with uh, you know, equal temperament uh, tuning. Uh, they're just f fine with natural tuning, but uh, uh, they don't work so well in modern tuning. But uh, they're very easy to play, but he he invented the the entire uh, brass family of the conical bore instruments. The, uh, they were quite popular but expensive to make, and he didn't succeed for more than about 15 years. Uh, eventually, opening his own factory and stuff. But this is his version of the trumpet, and it actually uses a cornet-sized mouthpiece uh, in terms of the shank itself and the opening to the lead pipe, and it plays and sounds like a modern trumpet. Again, there are just some intonation issues. Uh, but uh, very interesting. I, I focus my collecting of cornets and trumpets on, on his instruments nowadays. The top, top right was Kahn's uh, first sort of trumpet-shaped 
Cornet. This was what became known later as the Victor, uh, the Model 80A. And obviously very trumpet shaped with the exception of that funny little loop on the back bow of the bell, which was uh, to adjust for intonation issues. There was a little what we call opera glass style tuning me mechanism. Uh, probably Kahn's most successful instrument of all times. They were starting to be produced in 1960, and they were produced all the way up through the 60s. Um, and uh, bottom left is an earlier version of a trumpet, it's sort of Kahn's first stab at a trumpet. Uh, I'm sorry it came out so dark, but it's the first uh, instrument that we have from the eight, or early 1900s that actually has a third slide trigger. Um, we, we don't know of any other manufacturer that was making triggers for their uh, intonation device uh, before that. Um, still, obviously, a little reference to the cornet with the shepherd's crook. Um, so you know that it's sort of a hybrid between a trumpet and a cornet. <clears throat> and then last is the uh, con Trump, a cornet that was built as late as the, uh, the, the 50s and the 60s, absolutely trumpet shaped. The only difference is that the lead pipe starts out a little bit smaller, but it's got an identical trumpet uh, cousin that uh, if you play the identical cup mouthpiece on the two of them side by side, they're almost identical to experience uh, both as a listener and as a player. <clears throat> And Louis Armstrong played another type of hybrid, which was the Harry B.J. Columbia cornet. It was hybrid because it has a telescoping lead pipe, and they, they furnished both a cornet and a trumpet lead pipe with the kit. And uh, Louis played the cornet version of it. And if we have a soundtrack here, and you can hear what that sounded like, his early Okay, now before we go on to the next clip, this was Louis in the Hot 5, Hot 7 era, and uh, you can hear that's a very distinctive cornet sound. Uh, the next recording is uh, later on, uh, when he had switched to his uh, Selmer balanced action trumpet. It's quite a difference, huh? So you can hear that he's playing in a different register, which brings out the characteristics of the trumpet, the higher overtones and things like that. Uh, and then when he was playing the cornet, he was mostly down in the, the lower mid register. Uh, well, it turns out that the switch in popularity to the trumpet over the cornet happens about the time when recording and broadcasting happens, because 
the electronics of the day, these primitive electronic circuits, liked the sounds of the trumpet better in terms of what it reproduced. Uh, those natural high uh, upper partials predominated. They stuck out of the texture. The, those instruments were heard on recordings and broadcastings better. So that's what people wanted. And uh, manufacturers then started upping their production of trumpets and experimenting with uh, new uh, models and things like that. And so we had this transition. But again, you got to remember that the, corn the trumpet now has evolved into really a, a cornet stretched out. And cornets at this point, because <clears throat> the, of the popularity of the trumpet, start to evolve to be something more like a trumpet, in fact. We saw the example of a cornet that is built in exact shape of a trumpet. So by the World War II, there's really almost no difference between a cornet and a trumpet in terms of its uh, approach to building and sound production. Uh, because of the use of trumpet-shaped mouthpieces and cornets, cornets and trumpets pretty much sound alike. But there are some advantages from one to the other. The cornet retained its popularity in, in uh, pedagogy because Young players find them easier to handle. They're balanced better for shorter arms, and they're a little bit easier to play. Tone production's a little bit easier. It doesn't require as much air. And um, so they retain some popularity, especially in music education. It's funny that you know there's a bit of rivalry between trumpet and cornet players even to this day, but in the 19th century, it was, it was quite, uh, quite a battle. And <laughs> it had to do with class, essentially. Uh, the, the trumpet was associated in Europe, in particular, with royalty uh, and the upper crust and with the Catholic Church. Uh, in the United States, we rejected royalty and the Catholic Church, pretty much. And so we, we really had no need for, for trumpets and uh, sack butts, for instance. And uh, we were about industrial progress. And the rise of the popularity of brass bands and cornets uh, parallels and really is a very much an integral part of uh, the rise of the uh, Industrial Revolution and, and material progress. And uh, brass bands and the cornet being the, the so top solo voice became the sort of uh, herald of everything that was new and modern and every factory, every school, every town, even churches, uh, featured brass bands uh, with great pride because they uh, were a constant reminder of the upward progress of the American society in the world uh, in terms of our power and our wealth. And likewise in, in Britain, or not Britain, just Britain, but in Europe, however, the working class in Britain the people that were working in the factories and the mills and things like that, there was a bigger class distinction and the, they were more repressed uh, and considered vulgar. So the horns that they were playing with great success were considered vulgar as well. And the cornet was given a reputation as being a vulgar sounding instrument. Even Berlioz says something about that in his orchestration manual. Now, we haven't heard anything that sounds too <laughs> vulgar. Uh, uh, and uh, the early sounds of that, uh, say, Bogus' uh, slide trumpet were very much similar uh, to the cornet. So I think it was more perception and a class uh, distinction rather than a real accurate description of the cornet sound in terms of, or in the hands of a, of a good performer. So I think last we'll finish up. I could go on and on with all kinds of musical examples, but I wanted to. Uh, Finish with Rafael Mendez because uh, you know we know that he's sort of the last of the cornet virtuosos. It just turns out that he played all of his uh, virtuosic playing uh, on a trumpet instead of a cornet. Although there was uh, Olds made him a, a, a set of instruments uh, both in the cornet and the trumpet uh, design. They look identical with the exception of a little bit of difference in the bracing, but. Uh, Here's some Raphael Mendez. <laughs> 
So to um, to conclude, uh, the difference between a cornet and a trumpet it depends on when you ask. Uh, and primarily, there is a, uh, originally a distinction between the amount of conicity. Uh, but today, uh, since the advent of in 1860 of the standardized uh, valve casing, the amount of conicity is about the same in, in both a trumpet and a cornet. However, it's the rate of conicity that gives the cornet its broader, mellower sound because it flares sooner and quicker to the bell flare. Uh, the trumpet stays tighter longer and emphasizes the upper harmonics and therefore has a more brilliant uh, tone quality. Um, and then the, the major difference that gives you uh, even more impact on the sound is the shape of the mouthpiece. Uh, the deep funnel cup uh, brings out the cornet qualities of dark and mellow, whereas the uh, trumpet mouthpiece being a shallower bowl shape helps with the uh, production of the upper harmonics. So I'll leave it at that uh, and open it up to any questions you might have about this topic or repairs or whatever. Thanks. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, the safest thing is um, to to have your horn professionally cleaned and then do some maintenance on it yourself. And the best thing you can do is flush it out at least once a week. Just run it, you know, hold the bell under a tap, uh, bathtub or utility sink, and let a lot of fresh water run through it. Run a snake through it, flush it out again. You can use a little bit of uh, dish liquid on the bristles of your brush. Um, you know, but basically speaking, you want to start off with a clean instrument and keep it clean. Um, the, the biggest uh, enemy of brass is the stuff you blow into your horn. We don't spit into our horns, but our breath does condense in there, and our breath has caustic elements in it. And uh, it's the, the same things that cause cavities in your teeth, those plaques uh, and uh, other types of mineral deposits get caught in the lead pipe if you don't flush it out and begin to cause cavities, just like in your teeth. And as those cavities work their way through the walls of the brass and come through the other side, that's what we call red rot. Okay? So you, the best thing you can do is, you know, if you want to avoid a trip to the dentist, you brush your teeth or you brush out your lead pipe uh, on a regular basis. Um, and follow that up after the lead pipe is dried with uh, maybe a teaspoonful of valve oil and blow it through the horn from the mouthpiece end. Let it coat the instrument with a, a, a coat of oil. I like WD-40 because WD-40 and other oils of its type have some anti-corrosive elements, um, so it's a little bit more protective. Um, <clears throat> You don't want to, I don't recommend that you try any of the um, plumbing aids, you know, the things that we use uh, like CLR and things like that. I don't think it's a good idea. I mean, you, you hear, hear people talk about that, but it's real easy to have an accident. And I've certainly dealt with a lot of that, you know, people leaving that stuff in there too long or not rinsing it properly. So the other thing is oil your valves regularly. A lot of people just like to put it, you know, oil when they're starting to have trouble with their valves. Um, my prescription is before you start playing your horn every day, put a drop of oil on the valves. And if you're going to be putting it away for any length of time, put some oil in the valve casing before you put it to bed. The horns that we don't tend to practice as often, the piccolos, the flugel horns, um, that sort of thing, we put them to bed for t several weeks at a time and we pick them up and you can't move the valves because they've dried out and those mineral deposits have turned into crystals and locked up everything. So, um, so it's, if, you're going to, if you know you're not going to play a horn for a while, you should put it to bed clean and with some oil in it. Okay, any other questions? Yes? <laughs>
Yes. Uh huh. Um, well, you can actually you could add some little lever keys if you know if you can get them to be the right situated in the right places. You um, you could actually create little keys like little water keys <laughs> that would you know like those clapper keys. Um, uh, you'd have it would be a, a difficult process to alter it and switch where those are placed to fit your hand because you'd have to cover up those holes and recut new ones. So it'd be a bit of a, a project, but it could be done. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it came up uh, right along. It was a, a different family of instruments based on the horn shape. Um, so it was just a wider cone uh, shape. Uh, and they have been around, you know, came parallel with the uh, trumpet and the uh, post horn. Uh, notice that the word bugle, which I think has, is rooted in the Greek word or something for bull, okay, so the bull's horn, um, is very close to flugel, right? So if you think of the old traditional field bugles in G, they had that big wide bell. Well, that's what is the basis for the valved flugelhorn today. And they've been around since the you know, end of the 18th century going into the 19th century. And they developed right along with um, the cornet. Uh, and in fact, were more popular than the trumpet for a long time too. But again, it's an instrument whose voice is not quite as prominent. It's more uh, soft and, and tastes change, musical taste change, and it just kind of uh, lost some of its popularity with composers and with audiences. Uh, but, you know, every once in a while it floats back into awareness and, uh, and it's, you know, it's a lovely sound, of course, and certainly has its place. Back row. Sure. Sure. Well, uh, most horns being built and offered to the pro, pro market are quite good these days. Um, uh, so, you know, I'm not going to say one is any better than the other. I'm just going to say that these are on the list of excellent, not in any particular order. Uh, Joe Marcinkowitz's horns, obviously, yesterday are extremely well built and uh, well thought out. Um, and so, and that's the first I've had a chance to see them. No, no customer of mine has had one yet, and no stores in my area carry them. So, um, I was very impressed by what he did. Cliff Blackburn's horns are excellent. So are Roy Lawler's. The Sonare trumpet that uh, was produced with the Blackburn pipe is excellent too. Uh, I don't know if everybody's heard, but that company, the Powell Flute Company, that. Uh, had those being built by BNS in Germany is now bought blessing and it intends to start offering pro line trumpets again and build the Sonari trumpet there in Elkhart and they're in the process of moving their factory now to, to take on more capacity and modernize it um, and I expect good things from that and of course I'm gonna you know they're not gonna come to me but Yamaha is ma making excellent horns uh, too uh, Box reputation has slipped, although they're still capable of making uh, excellent instruments. Um, their, their reputation for quality control needs to be rebuilt, and, but they're starting to take up the task again because they went through you know, reorganization and a, a, un, a terrible union strike that made it difficult for them to produce good horns. It's not the fault of uh, the engineers or anything like that, um, but it's just the way it is. They're going to, but they're starting to rebuild their reputation. Um, there's someone else I was thinking of. 
that was built, oh, of course, Monette. Uh, if it suits your tastes, uh, are well built with good materials and uh, things like that. And my apologies to anyone I forgot. Taylor something. Huh? Taylor something. Oh, yeah, Taylor. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, there's some German makers too right now, Inderbinnen and, you know, a few of those guys. But again, these are things that I don't get to see on my bench very often. Uh, the fellow in the turquoise. Oh, yeah, I, I, I played a uh, Bach set at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Bach always offered it as an option. And to tell you the truth, as someone who's worked in the field of, uh, in, the, in a factory, uh, it's a complicated thing and very difficult to mount. It's time consuming. So it's hard to get that little lever system built onto that small crook without um, a, losing the proper alignment of the slide as you're doing it. It's real tight soldering. So if we don't need it, why mess with it? Okay. Uh, so you know, has a little end slide. Yeah, you pull that out and dump the water. Sure. Yeah. Well, I understand. Okay. Um, I'll take one more question and then I have to quit. I'm told that I've run over time wise. Yes, sir. No, I did not. I said I like WD-40 uh, and it does actually displace water. However, you don't mix it with water and you don't apply it. No, you just, uh, I use it uh, in, in my leaf.